Welcome to this week's GCN Tech Clinic. You know the score of how this works by now. You're sending your questions. We pick them out and answer them as best as we can. Let's get to it. First question this week says, um, I have a fancy pair of dressy casual boots that are going to need re... Well, I said resolving, but I presume... Resoling. Resoling. Would it be possible for a cobbler to build in a recessed mountain bike style plate, or is that just a really bad idea? Well, it, it could do. I mean, if you wanted to just have some boots to chuck on that you could walk around town in and also, you know, use your bike to then get into town or out of town or whatever, then yeah, like could be yeah. quite a useful hack to do to your to your footwear. But for actual serious bike riding, you'd want a dedicated cycling shoe, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, I feel like you're gonna have neither shoe in its optimal setup. So to do this, you'd probably have to get a cycling shoe, get the sole taken off, and get the cobbler to put it back on. It's quite a lot of work to have a boot, which isn't a very good cycling shoe, nor very good at a boot. Mm. Um, but so I mean, if you want your yeah, cobbler, I love that word. To, to, to modify them. Well, <laughs> fill your boots. Oh, right. Next oh, question is from uh, is from AJC7. He says, Ask GCN Tech, why is it that Ghana was DQ'd and got in trouble for an arranged bike swap at the Tour uh, de Provence? Yeah. Um, on but on the individual time trial at the 2020 Tour de France on La Planche de Belfi, lots of riders did it, including Pog and Rog. Just curious as to whether there is a rule about time trials or a rule change in the last year. Many thanks. Right, okay, so for those of you who didn't see this, what, it, what happened was there was a final climb um, and uh, Filippo Ganna was in the lead on GC and he was trying to retain that lead. Yeah. And so he swapped his disc brake bike F, Pinarello F, for a lighter rim brake one on the final climb. Now, while you are allowed to swap bikes, the reason why this uh, resulted in a DQ was because that bike didn't come uh, from the team car following him. It came from a, a helper on the side of the road, pre-arranged at that predetermined location with the bike ready to swap. Yeah. Now, in a time trial situation, they're allowed to swap bikes and you're allowed to swap bikes also on a road race. But the difference is, is it has to come from your team car. And in a road race, it's quite hard to sometimes you get go access all the to the team car. You have to go to the back of the peloton, drop out the convoy, wait for the bit where your team car is, and you're gonna lose the advantage of swapping. In a time trial, your team car's always there right behind you, and it's very quick to swap the bike, and there's no peloton or anything. So that's often the difference there. However, I'm We've seen the UCI be not all that consistent with their rules sometimes, yeah. haven't we? And make exceptions in some races. Yeah, so yeah. in certain instances, yeah, the, the UCI isn't always the best at, or the commissaires of that particular race aren't always consistent with how the rules are applied. So sometimes it's one rule for some and another for others. That's just kind of the way the way it is. Fair enough. Next question in. They say, hello guys, I'm looking From at- From Ezekiel. Oh, Ezekiel, sorry, I need to read the name out. I'm looking at purchasing a Canyon Ultimate. However, I'm in between sizes. What is generally better to go with? The smaller size or the larger size? We covered something along this lines a few weeks back. Now, in my opinion, it's always better to go for the slightly smaller size bike because it's much easier to then make it fit you by adjusting the handlebars, different stems, different bar widths, and of course you can just the other thing you can do is measure yourself and then apply that to the size guide that's on the Canyon website. And they actually, you can do um, live chats with, with humans on yeah. there who can advise you on the best course of action. I mean, that's what I've done and I've never had a problem picking the right size Canyon and I've had Although a few. I was gonna say, if you're really sort of unsure and you wanna get some sort of concrete information on making sure you buy the exactly right bike for you, you could just head to a bike fitter and get their advice. They'll be able to measure you up, size you up for the right time. Yeah, like the ID match system is yeah. really yeah. good for that. Uh, cool, Peter Scuba next, which he says, why don't the pros use tubeless? Oh, they Pogaccia do. does. Well, he yeah. just won uh, Strada Bianchi yeah. on, on Pirelli tubeless tires, so. They do. Saw a Paris Bay last year. Gradually, we're seeing pros adopting the tubeless technology, but it takes takes you know it takes time for change, doesn't it? Yeah, people yeah. people in life in general mm. are afraid of change. Look at us, we're sat the other way round. Yeah, um, we missed a question out from Rick Snyder. They say their bike um, currently has a long cage derailleur and 11 to 32 11 speed cassette. They then say they've got an 11 to 28 cassette in storage. Can I switch them out and use the same chain? Yes, you can. However, your chain is going to be a little bit longer than what it needs to be. So probably look to remove one or two links, but it'll be fine to use. But if you get the correct chain length, everything will work a little bit better. Yeah. 
Uh, next question is from Thomas K, who says, Guten Tag. I'm running a 23 mm front tire and a 25 mm back tire on my TT bike. Uh, they're both set up with latex tubes. My question is about a spare tube because those are either suited to 29, uh, 19, 23 millimeters or 25, 28 millimeters. Can I get away with the larger one in my 23 millimeter tire or the other way around? Which is the better solution? Oh, easy. And um, just go for the smaller option. It'll fold up smaller into your pocket and it'll fit the larger tire as a sort of backup option, if you ask. Yeah, I'd agree. Do yeah. that. Uh, that was easy. Uh, next one is from Ro uh, Roland Kol Kolovica. Oh. Good yeah. pronunciation. Um, he says, hi guys, thanks for all the answers. What I would like to know is when manufacturers state how many watts their equipment saves, what does that mean to me? Because different riders are of different weights and different drag coefficients, and they will require a different amount of watts to travel at the same speed. Please clarify this for me and other viewers so that we can better quantify aero claims made by Oh, this is a good question. Yeah, it, it is, yeah. Raises some very good points. I think what you need to do is look at the conditions that the bike or the part was tested in to see how much that relates to you. That's yeah. probably the first starting point. Yeah, and the, the, the frustrating thing is, is that things are always very system dependent as well. So, you know, the fastest helmet on, on you probably isn't or is likely not to be the fastest helmet on me or the fastest helmet on Alex because of the way that that helmet then interacts with the whole aerodynamic system and the shape of your body. So it can be difficult to verify manufacturers' claims, but on the one, on the, what they are intended to be is sort of a rough rule of thumb. But again, what you want to do is to look into them as much detail as possible. Manufacturers um, tend to, with more verifiable claims, tend to include more information, such as more yaw angles and a whole range of different speeds, rather than just saying, at 45 kilometers an hour. That's think, kind of almost become a bit of a standard, isn't it? 45K is what you most commonly see things yeah. tested at. 45 kilometers an hour is used because that's a speed that a lot of pros ride at, but also it's, you get a much greater resolution of aerodynamic data at that speed. It's harder to test accurately at lower speeds. Yeah. Um, also, it's why me and you do some simple experiments outdoors sometimes, isn't it? Mm. So we get a clear indicator of the differences. Yeah. Um, next up, we've got a question from Dave Pratt, who says, here's a maths question for Dr. Ollie Bridgewood. It's geeky side. Um, is there a theoretical max power for a rider of a given weight that they can produce at a given cadence? And they say they're assuming that they're not pulling on the handlebars. So then they say, isn't a rider's power purely limited by their weight? So I'm assuming what they're saying is, if you can't pull on the handlebars, you can't support your body. It's only your body weight pushing the cranks down. Is that right? Well, if, if, with the case of like any sort of animal or organism, there are going to be theoretical limits defined by physics as yeah. to what is physically possible. I've never actually investigated this to think what would be the maximum possible thing that a human could do in terms of power on a bike. Mm. But I'm sure I could talk to a biologist and. Yeah. And, and actually find an actual actual quantifiable answer. For example, there are limits exposed on like how sort of strong a human could be in terms of the maximum theoretical amount a human being could lift wow. or the maximum age a human could live to. These there are sort of established numbers that are beyond because of because of physics you you can't go beyond them. Wow, it's all going over my head. Yeah, okay. I'm going to look into that. I'm, I'm intrigued. Okay, right. On to our last question, which is from Maxwell Star. They say, hi, Alex, Ollie, Manon, slash random GCM presenter. We don't have any random ones. Um, so they say they're a heavier rider and live in a hilly area, but their bike uses rim brakes and alloy rims. They're curious about trying latex tubes, but worried if the heat generated from heavy braking would be a problem. Are latex tubes safe to use or should they stick to butyl? Thanks for the um, advice and great content. Where would you start with this? So the reason why Continental doesn't officially make a latex tubed tubular tire yeah. uh, for general purpose use, they, they only make the, the Pro Limited only available to Pros, which has latex tubes in it, um, is because of safety fears about yeah. latex tubes blowing out um, and and so that there is a there is a thing with on rim brake clinches latex tubes can sort of blow out more easily with hill, heat build up yeah. than than a normal butyl tube that is a thing 
So, yeah, I mean... It's not a problem I've ever had. And I've been running carbon rims and latex tubes, but that is the theory behind it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and I think the other thing is, like, you know, he, he says here that he's a heavier rider. Yeah. And so, yeah, there is going to be significantly more heat buildup and stress on the brakes if you live in a hilly area too. Yeah. And so, yeah, it is something that I think if I were you, I probably would not use them apart unless it was for like um, a, a flatter race or something like that. Mm. I'd put the latex tubes in. And I also would advise against using the thin butyl tubes you can get because, oh, yeah. again, they're, they're not good at the heat buildup and they can blow out um, with heat buildup in a rim brake. So, yeah, I would probably do that. But this is one of the advantages of disc brakes. Yeah. Don't get heat buildup in the rim. And, and that is a, is a big advantage. There you go. Safety first every single yeah. time. It's like the five watts that you would save in rolling resistance there on the disc brake bike more than offsets the weight difference in the disc brake bike. Yeah. As we showed in our how much difference does weight make video. Good. Um, well, that was our last question. Hope you enjoyed this week's GCN Tech Clinic. Apologies if we didn't answer your question. We'll try and get to it next week, I guess, shall we? Hmm. Right, see you later.